Everyone, thank you all for joining. Today we have the great honor and privilege of having Dr. Elaine Tremblay with us. Dr. Tremblay is a respirologist and professor of medicine at the University of Calgary in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. He is the clinical lead for the Alberta Thoracic Oncology Program, a rapid access program for patients with suspected lung malignancies and medical lead for the new Alberta Lung Cancer Screening Program. He has been involved in lung cancer screening research for over 15 years and curates the Twitter feed at lung underscore CA underscore screen. Dr. Tremblay, thank you so much for your time and willingness to be here with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So to introduce myself and my team, uh, my name is Priyanka Sanzon. With, with me, I have Anish Gugilam, and we are part of the American Lung Cancer Screening Initiative, or ALSI for short. And for those who might not be familiar with the organization, we have just a couple of slides to share about who we are. ALSI is a 501c3 nonprofit that works to raise awareness for lung cancer and lung cancer screening. We are a team of over 200 students and doctors located across the United States. And we do the work that we do because lung cancer is the deadliest cancer in the world, causing more deaths than breast, prostate, and colon cancers combined. Lung cancer causes about 380 deaths per day in the U.S. alone. Lung cancer is very fatal because currently many patients are being diagnosed at a late stage when the cancer has grown and spread to other parts of the body. Lung cancer screening is an effective imaging technique that can be used to screen for lung cancer and has been shown to catch lung cancers early. However, less than 6% of people at high risk for lung cancer are currently getting screened in the US. The screening rate for lung cancer is much lower than the screening rates for breast, cervical, and colon cancer, which are about 70%. We believe that educating people about lung cancer and lung cancer screening is one of the most important and effective ways to increase the lung cancer screening rate for populations that would benefit from lung cancer screening. So far, we've given over 140 presentations on lung cancer and lung cancer screening to universities, hospitals, medical schools, and organizations around the US, as well as India, Canada, Brazil, and Mexico, reaching over 10,000 people. Over the last year, we worked with over 130 mayors from every single U.S. state to issue proclamations recognizing November as National Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And we've also had the opportunity to work with several leaders at the state level, including Arizona State Senator Leela Alston, who is a lung cancer survivor, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf, and the Lieutenant Governor of Colorado, Diane Primavera, to increase awareness of lung cancer screening. And in addition to our education, outreach, and advocacy efforts, we recently started a podcast series to share the personal side of lung cancer and provide a platform for lung cancer survivors and experts to share their stories and experiences. Elsie has also worked with U.S. Congress members and senators to draft and advocate for the first ever House and Senate resolutions, recognizing the importance of the early detection of lung cancer through screening. And in December 2020, the Senate resolution was passed with unanimous consent, marking the first time the U.S. Senate has ever recognized the importance of screening. ALSI has also actively been working with Representative Brendan Boyle and Senator Tina Smith to draft and advocate for Catherine's Law for a Lung Cancer Early Detection and Survival Act of 2021. Lastly, we want to end by talking a little bit about lung cancer screening. Lung cancer screening is done using a low-dose computed tomography scan. This scan uses low radiation doses, is pain-free, and takes less than five minutes to complete. The United States Preventive Services Task Force, also known as the USPSTF, sets guidelines for who should be screened for lung cancer. And right now, they recommend that people between the ages of 50 and 80 who have a 20-pack year smoking history or more, and who are current or former smokers who quit within the past 15 years get annual low-dose CT scans. One pack year is defined as smoking on average one pack a day for one year, and therefore 20 pack years can be met in a multitude of ways, including smoking one pack a day for 20 years or smoking two packs a day for 10 years, for example. And if you know anyone who might be eligible for lung cancer screening based on the criteria listed on the previous slide, please feel free to share the link given by the QR code so that they can contact one of our doctors about lung cancer screening. And finally, we want to highlight there are other risk factors for lung cancer in addition to smoking, such as exposure to asbestos, a family history of lung cancer, COPD, and previous radiation therapy to the lungs. 
we believe it's important that we recognize these additional risk factors because a large number of people in the United States who have never smoked still get lung cancer. All right, thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to that short presentation. And without further ado, we can um, jump right into the podcast. We have a few questions prepared for Dr. Tremlay, but we also have a Q&A session with questions that we received um, from you all um, earlier. So, um, and this podcast is being recorded and will be shared on our Spotify, Anchor, Google and Apple podcasts, as well as our YouTube channel. Um, so wherever you're, you're listening um, to us from. First off, Dr. Tremblay, um, could you please introduce yourself and share your background? Oh, great. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm a respirologist. We call, call ourselves respirologists in Canada. In the US, we're, we're, we would be called pulmonologists. It's the same thing. Um, and um, yeah, I'm based in Calgary, Alberta, and uh, you know, on my clinic, on the clinical side, I've been uh, uh, working a lot with lung cancer patients and and rapid access clinics for people with lung cancer, and you know, from that and 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 you know, the interest in screening, of course, because still today in our clinical practice, as you know, uh, most of the of the people we diagnose with lung cancer, unfortunately, still are presenting with with advanced disease, which is much harder to treat, you know, despite all of the great advances we've seen in treatment. So that's on the clinical side. So so my research component at the university has really focused on uh, lung cancer screening over the past uh, 15 years or so, uh, in particular with uh, initially um, at the start of the pan-Canadian lung cancer screening trial, um, which Steve Lamb led out of uh, Vancouver. Um, and yeah, so, and so maybe that's important to state is some of the things we'll I'll probably uh, talk about today and answer the questions with is, um, you know, sometimes a different perspective, perhaps in the official guidelines in the states in particular. And it's not because I think they're wrong or or they shouldn't be followed, but it's just because we're we're obviously trying to to improve on on uh, the the current state. So uh, by definition. Um, we see the current state as imperfect and we want to keep improving on it. But I think people should, uh, when, when they come to their own health care, you know, uh, fo follow what the current guidelines are in, in their jurisdiction. So, so I'm not trying to contradict anything, um, but just to put that in context. Dr. Tremblay, what would you say is the current status of both lung cancer screening and a little more specifically lung cancer as a whole? Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly been been really neat neat to see this progress over the past uh, you know ten years. I would say, for, uh, you know, where where it's hit mainstream initially in the U.S. And I, and I should remind people who who don't realize that that the U.S. has really been the first country to to uh, you know fully endorse lung cancer screening. Um, most of the rest of the world is just now getting on the bandwagon. In fact, there's very few countries right now that are fully uh, funding, for example, lung cancer screening. Uh, in Canada, we're we're just getting things going um, on 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 clinically on a publicly funded or healthcare funded uh, lung cancer screening. So the U.S. really is probably five uh, to eight years ahead of the rest of the world. So uh, um, you know, because because we hear a lot of talk about how the uptake has been low in the U.S. and you know it's zero everywhere else. So it's actually quite quite good to see the uh, the you know, the rollout of, of lung cancer screening uh, south of the border for us. And um, even though it's, of course, not as quick and, and uh, uh, you know, complete as we would hope to see, um, but that will keep, keep improving over time. So it's it's really a work in progress, both in terms of um, rolling it out to as many people uh, as possible and then also improving the, you know, the selection criteria, how we do it, you know, the intervals, the the management of the findings. So, um it's really, really a, a field that's going to continue to evolve over, over the next uh, decades, for sure. Right, and I, I definitely agree with um, what you said, Dr. Tremblay. One of the most important things, I think, is improving the selection criteria you just mentioned. Um, one, uh, one study that our, um, our lab worked on was looking at how many um, individuals, um, African-American individuals diagnosed with lung cancer would have actually been eligible for lung cancer screening. And we saw that um, upwards of almost two thirds of those patients diagnosed with lung cancer wouldn't have been eligible um, right. because they wouldn't have met the lung cancer screening criteria in the US. And so I think there's lots of, a lot of work to, to do in that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, that's, I think that's a huge, um, a huge area of focus on it. And as you know, many, many uh, uh, people are, are looking into how to improve that. And, uh, you know, if you look at just what the NLST criteria, uh, you know, from, from the trial was, um, only about a third of all lung cancers, um, 
would have been detected even if everyone who qualified got screened. Uh, you know, that's better than zero, of course. Again, what, you know, it's all relative. If you're not screening at all, catching a third of all lung cancers, you know, is, is, is a great advance. But of course, you'd like to eventually get to 100%, right? Um, so how do we get closer to that? Um, so, so there's a few ways to do it. You know, you can broaden, broaden the criteria and, and go uh, to, a, a, you know, as, as, simple, as simply as, as taking a wider age, age range. So an LSD was 55 to 74. Well, if you go to 50 to 80, all, all of a sudden you're including more people or you're, 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 incru you know, you're catching more people um, uh, with lung cancer. And then you can go to lower risk uh, individuals or, or, or at least better define that risk. And of course, there's a lot of work being done on that. And the, the challenge with lower, lowering the risk too low is that you tend to catch fewer lung cancers per individual screened. And unfortunately, some of the negative effects of screening, because there's often some, ne you know, not often negative effect, but always can be negative effects from screening, uh, happen just as often if you're low risk or high risk. In fact, in some cases, like radiation exposure uh, is much more important if you're 40 years old as opposed to 80 year old. So some of the, some of the harms could actually be greater in lower risk uh, individual, for example, if they're younger. So so it's a, it's a careful balance um, between the two. But um, you know we we find that with if you use risk predictions uh, models, you're up to 60 percent uh, of all lung cancers could be detected. If everyone uh, eligible would be screened, you know, based on what cutoff you use. So, you know, just from NLST at 33%, we can be, we're already at 60%. Now it's not 100 yet, but hopefully we're we're going to keep pushing that boundary uh, higher as we as we be, as we figure out how best to select people. Great, and, and I think you might have already touched upon this a little bit, but could you expand more on how things have changed in the past 10 to 20 years with regards to lung cancer and lung cancer screening? And this can either be globally or um, within Canada. Mm. Well, uh, like I said, for over 20 years, we went from no screening outside of research programs. Uh, perhaps there was some ad hoc screening by primary care physicians with chest x-rays, which unfortunately we know is not effective. Um, so we were doing some screening that wasn't effective, and we weren't really doing any any active screening in, outside of research programs. So as I mentioned now in, in the US, you know, it's funded by uh, Medicare, uh, it's funded by private insurance. Um, you know, it, it's more of a question of implementation and, and reaching those populations at risk. Uh, and, and then in the rest of the world, it's really a question of uh, funding it and implementing it. In Canada, we're, we're a publicly funded system. So um, the challenge, for example, for us is we can't just at a hospital just start screening. Um, I can't just say, okay, at, at my hospital at Foothills, I'm going to start screening a few hundred people a year. The, the, the decision in a, in a place uh, like Canada is a provincial decision. So uh, we have about 140,000 people eligible for screening. So if we start screening in my province, we need to be ready to take 140,000 people a year. Now, we'd never reach that. Um, but we, maybe we'd get 70,000. So it, it's a bit of a rough start to get a program off the ground because the cost, the resources, um, um, you know, the, the processes have to be uh, really, really developed uh, well in advance. So it's a bit of a slower start. Um, you know, for example, we don't have enough thoracic surgeons to operate on people um, with lung cancer if we screened 140,000 people a year. We just wouldn't have the capacity to do it. You know, we have, I believe, 15 thoracic surgeons, not even, I think we have 12 thoracic surgeons in the province. We'd probably need 20. And it takes 11 years to train a thoracic surgeon. So you kind of start to see the challenges of, of full-scale, publicly funded lung cancer screening, which, which has not been done anywhere in the world, to my knowledge, as yet. No, no full uh, population-based program exists anywhere in the world. So that's the challenge in, in a place like Canada is, is uh, getting, getting such a massive program off the ground. But we're seeing it, and we're, and we're sorry to complete that. And we're seeing the same in Europe, France. Uh, the UK is probably the, the most advanced uh, uh, country where, uh, in, in Europe where they have uh, you know, multiple large-scale uh, programs uh, up and running. Um, and and the Aust Australia, other places around the world are really, really at that stage of, okay, how do we, we know it works now. We need to really figure out how do we fund this? How do we actually do it? How do we, how do we get all our, our uh, population involved and, and screened? What are some of the current research projects that you're involved in? And could you tell us a little about them? 
right? So we, we just finished in Alberta a, a single arm project where we compared um, uh, NLST-like criteria that we mentioned before, which are basically age and, and, and um, pack years of smoking uh, based uh, to a risk prediction model, the, the PLCO 2012 model, um, which is one of the popular models out there out of um, Brock University in Ontario. Uh, from uh, Martin Town and Maggie, so we comp we enrolled pe uh, people that met either criteria, and we tried to compare the efficiencies. And there's a big overlap between the two. You know, about 80% of people that would get screened would meet both, uh, but then there's some people that meet one and not the other. And and what we find is, um, uh, we found prospectively um, that uh, it's been done ret retrospectively in in uh, in big cohorts, but it's the first time that we've shown prospectively that it's more efficient. In, in finding cancers and uh, in patients with cancers. Essentially, if you meet uh, uh, NLST or, or USPSTF criteria, but not a risk uh, model, your risk is very low. Um, so you're, you may not, you know, you may not, uh, you, you may not um, benefit from the screening. The converse is, is not true. If you don't meet the uh, uh, USPSTF uh, criteria, but have a risk over 1.5%, we find just as many cancers in that group. Um, so that's why we think it's a more efficient way to, to do things. So that's kind of been the main research. Um, in the last year, we've kind of flip, flipping around and, and, and focused on implementing the, um, the clinical program, which actually starts in Alberta in uh, 20 days. Um, so we're about to open, open three sites for screening um, uh, for the next two years as a pilot. So uh, the, the research parts has been a bit of on, on the back burner for the last year as we, as we plan to implement that. Uh, but we are collaborating with uh, with some other groups on biomarker research, for example, to help um, uh, both identify patients at higher risk and also how how uh, best to manage lung nodules when we do find them uh, on screening or or otherwise. So, uh, trying to keep those those projects active. That's very interesting. I know that um, recently there have been many research groups that have been evaluating like different risk prediction models and what the ideal risk threshold is. And it's it's difficult to kind of know um, what what factors to even include in the risk prediction model. Like mm -hmm. um, you know, pack your smoking history is probably one that 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 would need to be there, but are other what other factors need to be there, like um, exposure to secondhand smoke or these are other um, known risk factors for lung cancer that are maybe more difficult to quantify. So, yeah, yeah you hit the, the nail on the head. So, so we know we know for the most part we know a lot about other risk factors for lung cancers, but how do we quantify it and ask someone about it? Like, if I if I ask you what's your rate on exposure over the last thirty years, you know, you, you no one can answer that, right? Um, Things like uh, 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 pollution, we can start to say, okay, where have you lived over the last 30 years? Look at your postal codes, pull some information about uh, you know particulate matters in those areas. So you can start to do that, but it's complex. But at least, but it would be possible. You know, that's why uh, you know the, you know most of the risk models are focused on age and smoking because they're easy to quantify and they are the biggest drivers. Um, the other ones are harder to quantify and have a lesser impact. Uh, but the uh, PLCO model, uh, as you probably know, has other, it does have some of these other things like family history, which is quite important, presence of emphysema, um, a, a social economic status and education status, which is, a, you know, again, a surrogate for probably many other things. Um, risk models don't have to actually be causative, meaning you don't need something in the model that is, is a direct cause of the cancer. It only all, all it has to do is predict who has the cancer. It can be a surrogate. That's fine because we're not trying to de determine the biology of lung cancer. We're trying to figure out who's most at risk. Um, so, for example, socioeconomic status or educational status. Well, it's, it's not going to university itself that decreases your risk of lung cancer, right? It's all of the perhaps health uh, health um, uh, behaviors around that, your occupation, all those things might affect it. It just might mean, mean that you're less likely to live next to a highway if you went to university because uh, you have uh, more money and you live in a, a nicer neighborhood. So these are predictors, even though if biologically they're not direct, uh, uh, they're directly causative for lung cancer. But that can actually be problematic. So for example, the, um, you know, the, although, um, the PLCO model was developed by uh, um, Martin Tam Maggie in Canada. It's actually based on a U.S. data set, the PLCO study. Um, so we, we're struggling with things. Well, how do we how do we incorporate 
uh, the increased risk seen in the U.S. for African Americans, you know, which has big, been a big, uh, big area of research for many, and an important one. When in Canada, the 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 black population in Canada is is somewhat different than the the African American population. In fact, they have very low lung cancer rates in Canada. Our black Canadians, some of the lowest around, they're they're. Uh, and, and that's simply because they don't smoke very much. They have a very low smoking rates in, in the single digits. Um, so because of that, they have very low, low smoking rates. So do we use the TAMIMIP PLCO model in Canada? Does it apply? We don't know. We don't have, we're unable to correlate that data. So how, how do we apply these models developed in one country or, 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 or group and extrapolate that to Europe, Australia, Asia? Very different populations, right? So. Um, even though we were making great progress, we, we, we just come up with more questions and more, uh, uh, you know, the need for more information to, to validate these things. Yeah, you bring up some really, really great points. Thank you. So for a lot of patients, um, a concern about lung cancer screening is false positives and radiation exposure. So can you please discuss both of these topics and whether they should be a major concern for patients? Yeah, I mean, I think we can't ignore them. And I think, you know, that's certainly one of our area where we focus a lot of our efforts on is how do we streamline the process to, 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 to make it as, as low risk as possible. You know, on the radiation dose, um, you know, the, the, the progress continues to amaze me on, on how low the radiation can be. You know, there, there's uh, interesting studies on ultra, what they call ultra low dose radiation um, a low dose CT scan, and and uh, you know they seem to get fairly good images. And interestingly enough, you get less false positive because you lose a little bit of resolution of the CT. So these tiny nodules, you tend not to see them. So there's actually a bit of a benefit to having a, a bit of a lower resolution scan um, in terms of false positives. You know, depending on what what you call the false positive. So there's there, we're we're going to see progress on the radiation dose. You know, the main issue there is what do we do with younger patients? You know, say we can identify 40 year olds, 30 year olds that might be at risk of lung cancer. Well, is the radiation dose uh, justify the, the risk? Because radiation tends to cause, uh, you know, long term uh, risks, uh, not short term. So the younger we go with our threshold, the more radiation becomes a, a bit of a concern. You know, the false positive, it, you know, to some degree, sometimes it's just about definitions and, and not overreacting to things. And, you know, people often, the administrators say, well, the NLST showed 27, 26% false positive. It's like, well, that's not true. They saw nodules, but they're, that doesn't mean they're positive. So we, we, we do a lot of work with our, uh, uh, when we enroll patients in screening to let them know many people have nodules, that's not a positive scan. So there's a bit of managing expectations and letting people know what, what's considered within the range of normal. To give you an example, if, if your risk of lung cancer is, uh, let's say, 3% when you come into the to screening and you have a two millimeter nodule on your scan and nothing else, your risk is actually much, much lower than 3% at that point because we didn't find a big lung cancer, right? So, so but then people might, might get a result saying, well, there's a spot in my lung. I'm worried. Well, no, no, your, your risk is actually much lower now than it was before. So again, it's all how you communicate these things. You know, and, and that's not a positive, actually, that's a quite a, uh, uh, it's a negative, it's a good news scan to have just a two cent, two millimeter nodule, for example. Um, so it's important to, to make sure that's communicated well. But, with, you know, with modern protocols, with uh, either nodule calculators or lung rads, uh, whatever system you have, you can greatly, greatly reduce the number of people that need, uh, you know, anything more than a low dose CT follow up. Um, so PET scans and clinical assessments are quite rare, you know, probably, you know, you know, certainly less than 10% and probably more less than 5% if you manage things um, uh, with, with the protocol. You mentioned earlier in a response that communication was very important. So from your experience working with lung cancer patients, what are some misconceptions patients tend to have regarding uh, lung cancer as a whole, as well as, as well as lung cancer screening? Yeah, for, for the screening part, yeah, it's, it's important to have a very clear communication plan. And like I said, I think it needs to start before the screening uh, so that people don't, you don't increase people's anxiety uh, associated with the results. Of course, some people will get some concerning findings that need uh, evaluation, but uh, you know, most of those even won't turn out to be lung cancer. So it's important to manage those expectation and then communicate clearly 
uh, you know, both to the individual screened and to the primary care group, we know what the findings mean. Uh, again, you know, some, some primary care physicians are not uh, as familiar with this and, you know, they might be concerned about the three millimeter nodule um, and, and, and relay that, that concern to the patient when really it's not, not that concerning. So, so we need some education for primary care so they can help, help uh, um, with, with that uh, communication as well. Um, you know, in terms of communication for for lung cancer, I, I think that's a different thing. I'd have to think about that. You know, um, you know, it's it's a, a bit more of a different game at that point. Again, most of our people are presenting with symptoms, right? And and they're they're being assessed for symptoms, and um, you know, that's a whole 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 different piece of piece of cake, if you want. You know, I'm not sure I have any clear clear areas of concern in terms of communication for. For, uh, for that group. And you mentioned that communication uh, among primary care physicians is, is really important when um, when discussing you know findings from from a scan with patients. And um, on on that on a similar route, I think a lot of um, some studies have shown that even primary care physicians are not aware of the the updated USPSTF screening guidelines um, in in the US. And so even just educating primary care physicians and healthcare providers in general about the screening guidelines, this was the specifics like the age criteria, the smoking criteria. Um, I think that can really help um, increase the uptake of lung cancer screening as well, since for most patients, um, they, they really do trust their doctors and um, lung cancer screening might probably be first discussed to them with by their primary care physician or healthcare provider. So I think if we're able to even just have education workshop, educational workshops um, or, or webinars to ensure that all healthcare providers um, are aware of the screening guidelines. I think that can that can help as well, and and can yeah, also yeah, like absolutely, yeah, uh, absolutely. I think I think you know uh, primary care is a key key player here for all screening interventions, and and in particular for a new one like this, uh, that where or patients themselves may not have heard about it. It's important to do that, and you know your your group's done great work on that uh, as you uh, described earlier, and we're we're setting up CME events for the physicians in our in our project, so in the primary care physicians in our project, so they are aware of it and. Um, they understand the process um and then you know eventually there'll be public me public uh, facing messaging as well um to encourage people to get screened and, you know it's going to be on you know the, the 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 websites that have breast cancer screening colorectal lung will be there all these things will, will kind of become integrated and it, it is a bit of a different um approach because unlike other screening it's not just age based and gender based right it's it's the risk and the, and the smoking so so it is a little little different messaging that uh, has to go out there and and uh, some of the screening uh, people are struggling with that a little bit they're like well this is not really screening because we're not screening everyone it's like well you're never screening everyone um, you're just being a bit more targeted here you're you, um so so the, the you know even even talking to people about pack years and i know you you explained it well in your introduction but you know it's not you know, most people don't have no clue what a pack year is, right? You know, the people in the medical field, you know, you, you just assume everyone knows what that is, but that's not the case. So you can't just go on the TV and say, you know, 15 pack years get screened. People say, what does that mean? Right. So you have to, to, to educate people on that. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of work to be done on that, for, on, on that whole front, uh, you know, that, and that's the nature of a, of a new program like this. Definitely. And on the topic of misconceptions, um, one, uh, one pattern that we've seen with our previous lung cancer survivors who've been on our podcast is that a lot of them have been never smokers and diagnosed with mm -hmm. lung cancer at, at a pretty young age, um, at, not within the, the USPSA criteria. And so um, something that, that they've always, that most of these patients have said is that lung cancer was never on their radar because they, they never smoked and they, um, they knew that neither their doctors um, you know, we're thinking about lung cancer as being um, a potential cause for any of the, the symptoms um, or complications that they were um, experiencing. And so I think that's something that we've really, um, that, that we've encountered a lot with people being really surprised that lung cancer can occur in, in never smokers mm -hmm. and that it's um, a, a pretty large proportion of individuals diagnosed with lung cancer that are never smokers. And in the U.S., it's about 10 to 20% of individuals so almost 
you know, upwards of one in five individuals diagnosed with lung cancer um, are never smokers. So right. that's something. That, yeah, that's and, something. And, and probably another 20% are, are what I would say light smokers, meaning they wouldn't reach the, the screening cutoff. So that's why we're at that 60% mark, right? Is that we're, we're missing uh, the lighter smokers, the ex smokers, people that have quit smoking, and then the people that have never smoked and have other. Uh, uh, reasons or risks for for lung cancer or unknown risks, and uh, you know th that's going to be more challenging. And uh, again, with the, with the risk models, I think we get a few more of the lighter uh, uh, exposed uh, cigarette users, and and uh, the other ones is people that have quit. Uh, you know, we know people that have quit 16, 17 years; they can still be at risk. So you 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 catch those uh, a bit better with uh, with the risk prediction models, uh, but but. Uh, people that have never smoked, you know, would never uh, reach our risk threshold uh, as the model currently is, you know, to reach 1.5%, if that's what you use. Uh, even if you have all the other risk factors in the model, you, you don't cross, uh, you don't cross that. And then the young age is the problem as well, you know, so if you're less than 50, we don't even do the calculation, right, because we don't want to uh, go beyond that. So, you know, what what is it going to take to to find those people? Because again, you can't, you know, we, I mean, I, I've seen 40 year olds in my practice with lung cancer and, and they've never used cigarettes. And the question is, well, you do you go out and do CT scans on all 40 year olds. And the answer is, unfortunately, no, that's not that's not the solution. So we need to better understand the risk profile. Is there, you know, is there a simple blood test that we can do? Are there genetic markers? Is it radon quantification? You know, there, we're uh, one of my colleagues here at the university is working on uh, taking toenail clippings. For, for what it's worth, and uh, looking at uh, byproducts of, of radon exposure. So, you, you, you know, the, the idea is you could, you could take a toe clip, do an analysis, and figure out someone's long-term radon exposure. And then you start to say, okay, now I've got something, you know, simple that, that I can incorporate in my risk model uh, that, that we're not capturing right now. Um, and, 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 you know, other people are looking at different types of blood, blood markers and proteins and, and, and whatnot uh, to try to quantify that risk. So I think we're going to have to, we're going to need a, some improvement in our risk predictions uh, to get beyond that 60% uh, catchment of, of lung cancers. To get, and, and really that's to get to those uh, people that have never smoked or have fairly light smoking history. Um, at this point, we're just not there. We're just not there. You know, uh, the, the only place where I would say that's the exception is in Asia, um, where, uh, you know, non-smoking uh, lung cancer is even more common than it is in, in North America and Europe. Um, and, and presumably that's based on genetic uh, profiles. Um, interestingly enough, in the Asian population, they have in, in never smokers, higher risk of lung cancer, and then smoking is a lower has a lower impact than it does for 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 um, uh, people in Europe and North America, and mostly Caucasians. So it's a bit of a different uh, genetic mix um, uh, over there. So some, so, you know, there's some reports of reasonable uh, risk, um, you know, reasonable uh, uh, lung cancer finding rates in people that have never smoked um, uh, with CT screening. But in in North America right now, in Europe, I, I don't think we're there yet. So um, what do you believe are the best ways to educate patients and healthcare providers about the lung cancer screening guidelines? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, I mean, I, I think it's things like you're doing. I think it's educating primary care. I think it's article in the in the lay media, uh, social media, all these things. And I see a lot of it. Uh, I, as you mentioned, I, I, I try to curate this uh, lung cancer screening feed and, and post some things and retweet other, other things. I, I don't have as much uh, time on Twitter as, as I might have to, to do it uh, a professional, you know, prof as a professional might. But, you know, I think it's very, the, one of the main reasons was to kind of, you know, disseminate uh, as much information as possible on lung cancer screening, you know, uh, both for individuals, so they know about it and go out and get screened, but also for, for physicians and, and researchers and anyone that's involved in lung cancer screening. So I think we need all of those things. Um, and, um, you know, but it, is, it, it does take time. Um, I, I'm very curious to see how it'll work in Canada with, um, you know, with a bit different approach because it's going to be a publicly funded system where we can actually go all out and, and do kind of public education can, campaign on, you know, on, on, on TV and in, 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 in the media kind of a, at a, on a broad scale. Uh, so we look forward to seeing how that uh, rolls out. You know, are we going to be able to get 
you know, 50% participation rates uh, more quickly? Uh, or are we going to be in that, uh, you know, 15% for, for many years? I don't know. So the lung cancer screening rate is often lower in patients of Black, Hispanic, and Native American race. So how would you say we can best reach priority, as we would call them, populations? Yeah. Again, the, the answers might be different in different areas. You know, I, certainly in um, in Alberta and in Canada, when we're we're rolling, uh, we're starting to roll these pilot projects out and programs out. It's it's certainly a, a key consideration in our in our uh, approach. Um, you know, we, we don't have to consider private insurers, you know, healthcare system, all that. It's all one. So in some ways, it's a little simpler from a healthcare administrative point of view. But, you know, the, these these populations are sometimes hard to reach for, for other reasons as well. And, um, you know, I mentioned that the Black Canadians, you know, is 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 an important one for us, but it's maybe not as high as a priority. We're, we're quite concerned about our Indigenous populations who have extremely high pop, uh, uh, lung cancer rates. So our, our Inuit uh, populations in the far north, um, you know, I have two and a half times the lung cancer rate as the rest of the population in Canada and, 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 and very poor outcomes once they get it. Um, so um, in our program in Alberta, we're, we're you know, from the get-go, we're involving uh, First Nations and Métis and Indigenous communities in the planning. Um, you know, we're, we're reaching out to communities uh, in our pilot projects that are, have uh, large um, Indigenous communities, uh, specific clinics, uh, primary care clinics that um, have large uh, uh, Indigenous uh, uh, populations in their rosters. So we're, we're kind of trying to build some of these things up front. Um, and, and because we're using the risk models, we, you know, that does have a, a, a factor, uh, increase the factor of risk for, uh, for those populations. So, you know, we'll, it'll ensure that we enroll, uh, you know, uh, an appropriate, uh, you know, appropriate risk uh, people. So, for example, in our uh, Inuit populations, if you didn't use that um, ethnicity factor um, and use the 1.5% cutoff for risk, it's essentially like using a three percent cutoff for that population. So that's how that's how these these pure um, year based uh, uh, criteria uh, disenfranchise these population. It it artificially sets a different risk threshold based on on those factors. So um, it's it's one of the ways to improve equity in programs is to use these risk models, and um, you know the way one of the reasons to, that we advocate for those. And it's interesting. All provinces in Canada there's, uh, there, that are uh, starting programs are all using risk models and not, uh, you know, NLST-like criteria. So, for any um, patient, any listeners who are um, who are experiencing or undergoing lung cancer treatment right now, what advice do you have for for these lung cancer patients? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you if you undergo if you if you yourself have lung cancer, then you know it's it's a very complex disease. It's not one disease anymore. You know, the the oncologists tell me it's uh, sixty diseases now. You know, with all the different molecular profiles that are each treated differently. So it's you know, that's where the treatment has been remarkably uh, evolving and so quickly evolving over the past uh, years. And you know, to the benefit of the patients. Um, um, Unfortunately, the advanced lung cancer is remaining curable, even though the treatments have improved greatly. Uh, but some people do, you know, remarkably well. I mean, we have, you know, again, patients that are around with stage four lung cancers for five years and, and more, which was unheard of, um, you know, just 15 years ago. So it's quite, quite remarkable. So of course, you know, get assessed, get evaluated, follow the advice of your, of your oncologists and, and surgeons and, and the treatment team. You know, but but on, on that note, you know, we mentioned how family history is an important factor. So if you yourself have lung cancer, well, you know, assuming you have a family, you know, there's an intervention that you can do there. OK, so um, your brothers and sisters, should they get screened? Uh, should they quit smoking if they're smoking? Same with your daughters and 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 uh, and sons and parents, perhaps, um, if you're if they're still alive. So. You know, it's it's a it's a, a warning to the whole family that they might be at risk, especially if there's some other factors. Make sure their your house and your kids' house and your grandkids' house get radon tested, and mitigate that. 
right? So, so there are things you can do as a lung cancer patient that will affect your, your, your loved ones around you. Um, so it's important to think about that. And of course, if they're eligible, if your loved ones are eligible to get screened, by all means, encourage them to get screened. Um, so those are kind of kind of things related to screening and 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 reducing the risk of lung cancer in in the in, in your uh, broader family, um, where you can have a big impact. Um, you know, beyond just um, you know your own treatments that that of course you need to pursue and and follow. Thank you so much, Dr. Tremblay, for taking time out of your day to share your work with us and your experience. Now I'd like to transition to uh, the questions people submitted to us. Great. So I'll start off with the first question. Um, this person asks, what do you believe is the role of doctors in addressing the stigma around lung cancer? Mm -hmm. And I think they're referring to um, the stigma that only smokers um, get lung cancer or that it's a smoker's disease. Yeah, you know, that's, it's such a huge issue for, for, for lung cancer. And, um, you know, interestingly, you know, there's kind of two parts to it. You know, there, there's the stigma that the people who smoke who get lung cancer face and continue to face. And then there's the stigma that people who didn't smoke who got lung cancer face. And, and to some degree, they're, I mean, they're, they're both, um, you know, unacceptable. Um, so, so we can't just say, well, it, it's not fair to people who've never smoked to be asked if they've smoked before, because to some way that re-stigmatizes the, the person who smoked and blames them for their disease. So no one, you know, no one deserves to get lung cancer, whether they smoked or not. Um, you know, I, I say that, you know, the average age of, uh, uh, smoking initiation, um, uh, uh, at least up here is 16. So below the age, uh, the legal age of, uh, being allowed to buy cigarettes, that's when people quit. So. Our society is uh, providing cigarettes to kids still today, um, and um, you know in Alberta we get a billion with a B a billion dollars a year in tobacco taxes to our government. So the population is selling tobacco to kids today. So and it is the most difficult substance to um, quit. Uh, is, uh, nicotine is extremely addictive, as we all know. If it was if it wasn't, we wouldn't be here today talking about. How, how bad lung cancer is, but um, so 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 society does have a, a big role to play here, um, and and we can't be blaming everyone for for uh, for their lung cancers, whether again they use cigarettes or not. So I think that's critical. Um, that being said, you know it's it's also the reason there's been so little funding for lung cancer research. I mean, the funding compared to other cancers uh, per death is you know something like one percent. Uh, of, of what you get for other cancers. And, uh, and we see the same for clinical funding. And, and uh, um, you know, and, and one of the problems has been lack of advocacy. You know, you don't, you, you, you don't see as much. You see it more now. And, and in great part is because people uh, without smoking histories with lung cancer are advocating. Uh, but people who smoked all their life, they, they stigmatize themselves. They blame themselves. They don't go out and march for lung cancer uh, research when they've smoked uh, all their life because they feel guilty. Um, and, you know, they feel guilty enough that we don't need to pile it up, uh, pile it on top of it. When I, when I tell someone who, who's, who's smoked a long time that they have lung cancer, you know, their face just goes, yeah. And they go to their spouse, I'm sorry, you know, because they, they blame themselves already. Um, so we, do, we don't need everyone else to, to blame them as well. Uh, it's, it's just not useful. And, and, it, and it reduces the, um, you know, the incentive to get screened, it, it, it pushes away from people away from healthcare. So, I, I mean, you know, stigma is such a huge part of lung cancer, um, you know, it just can't be ignored. Um, and, and, and again, and it's, and it's, you know, it's, this is not a blame game, this is healthcare. And, um, you know, if we start blaming people for all their illnesses, I tell you, our hospitals would be, um, you know, there'd be a lot of blame for a lot of diseases that we see in our you know, that are, that are influences by healthcare, by a health, uh, um, lifestyle choices, I should say, and, and behaviors, right? I mean, name me a disease that isn't, you know, the big ones all are. So if, if we, if we do that, you know, I, I don't know, that's the kind of society or healthcare system I want to be part of. Um, but for some reason we've accepted that for lung cancer. Uh, we don't for coronary disease, even though, you know, smoking is a big risk for it. We don't for diabetes, even though, you know, um, diet and, and exercise are important things. So why do we, why do we accept it for lung cancer? 
Yeah. And you know, it's, I, the other thing I tell people is when people, someone gets lung cancer, it's not just them that suffers. Um, it's their family. It's their kids. Um, you know, we, we see lung cancer patients with uh, teenagers at home still, you know, they're still young and, you know, everyone, everyone around that person uh, suffers sometimes even more so um, than the patient. And um, again, what did they do to deserve that, right? So, you know, the, the blame game, the stigma just has no place in, in, uh, in the healthcare system and in, in this type of society. This next question is a little more focused on the screening situation uh, here in the United States, but just based off of your expertise, what are your personal recommendations for individuals who are at high risk for lung cancer due to a smoking history or other risk factors, but are not eligible for a screening according to the 2021 USPSTF lung cancer screening guidelines? Right. So, I mean, that's a great question. And um, so there's a few aspects to that. So the first thing I would do if I thought I was at risk, uh, but didn't meet the guidelines is, is I'd go to one of the, the websites that where you can calculate your, uh, your risk based on a model like the PLCO 2012. And there's several out there if you Google them. Um, and if my risk was above 1.5 and I didn't meet the guidelines, I'd say, yeah, I, I think I should still get screened. You know, then the, the, and then you can talk to your you know, primary care provider that, the problem there is, will you get funded to do that? And that will depend on your insurance and all kinds of things that I, as a Canadian, don't quite understand. So, so you'll have to sort that out. Um, and maybe you can pay for it um, uh, out of pocket if you think it's really worth it. If you calculate your risk and it, it turns out to be quite low or you're very young, you know, then I'd probably say, you know what? Uh, my risk is quite low. It's probably, even though I'm concerned about lung cancers for reason A, B, or C, um, you know, it doesn't look like I need to get screened at this point. You know, I, I should be comforted by the fact that my risk is, you know, much lower than 1%, for example, um, and not, and not go through the potential harm or expense of getting screened. Um, and then the final point I would make there is when we talk about screening, we're not talking about checking for a symptom, right? We're talking about people with no symptoms. So, you don't mistake that for, oh, I've had a new cough for the last three months and I saw a little bit of blood, I should get lung cancer screening. That is not lung cancer screening. That is a medical investigation for a symptom. So in no way should you ignore those symptoms. And if you have those symptoms, you shouldn't be sent for a screening scan. You should be sent for whatever investigation your physician thinks is, should be done, which you know could be an x-ray at first, or if it's a CT, probably should be a full diagnostic CT. Uh, that has, you know, different features than what a, a low dose CT scan has. So, you know, in no way should you ignore symptoms. And I, you know, I know, I know we alluded to it before people that have never smoked and have had these symptoms and they don't get investigated um, because, you know, people say, well, it can't be lung cancer. Well, we don't tend to think that way as physician. We tend to think, well, you have a new cough. What could it be? You know, Sure, lung cancer may be low on my list if I see a 40-year-old who's never smoked. It should be low on my list because there's many other causes of cough. Um, that being said, it doesn't mean I don't do a chest X-ray, right? And if I see a mass on the X-ray, then it's like, oh, then your 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 risk profile is, is completely changed. But that's not screening. So please, 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 if you do have symptoms, uh, see your primary care physicians, get investigated for that symptoms until there's an explanation for it. Great. So this next question asks, what do you consider to be the most challenging aspect of your work? Right. Um, well, on the clinical side, um, you know, I, I find great value in my work and, and great pleasure, but it, but it is difficult, um, especially now that we know we have an effective intervention to, to continue to see uh, people present over and over again every day with advanced lung cancer. Um, again, there's, you know, we're, we're much better at doing the diagnosis min with minimal invasive tools and staging people and finding their molecular profile and, the, and, the, and offering, you know, the, these amazing treatments that are out there, but it, it's still not, there's, there's still a better way and it's to, to detect them early um, um, when they can be cured more easily. Um, so, so that's on the clinical side, probably the hardest part. On, on, the, on the screening side, really it's, you know, the advocacy is just unrelenting. I mean, how much, and that goes back to the stigma, you know, how much evidence we've needed to implement lung cancer screening. You know, we, we have more evidence now than we have for, for any other screening program. 
yet you know our administrators are still questioning is is the risk is the cost justifiable and you know they don't they don't necessarily come out and say you know um, uh, that it's because people have brought them on themselves but you know that that's part of it that's you know they're like really should we really be investing in that shouldn't we this they say often shouldn't we just put all this money in smoking uh, cessation and i say yeah, well you have a billion dollars in taxes put it all in smoking cessation i'd be keen just give me 20 million for the screening the truth is of the one billion dollars almost none of it goes back to healthcare or to helping smokers so it's a bit of a of a straw dog that's not uh, you know not really thought of so so yeah, that, that's the hardest part is we just need to keep advocating, um, advocating, advocating, advocating for better screening, more screening, more screening, more funding for screening, organized screening, cessation services to go along with that, um, and primary prevention and keeping uh, nicotine out, out of our, our kids' bodies uh, so that we're not dealing with this in 60 years still. I'll be retired, but someone else will have to deal with it. So this last question that we have is more of a personal question. So feel free to, to share, um, you know, how much of your you feel comfortable. The, the person asks, why did you choose a career in the lung cancer field? Yeah, well, that's a good question. You know, we go, through, we train through in medicine and we, and we go through these different paths and, um, you know, we end up where we are and, you know, I wouldn't have predicted it. Um, you know, I, I, I was affected by lung cancer as a child, not not from a family member, but a very close neighbor who was basically our uncle, you know how it is, you know, a, a, a fellow that was older than, than my parents were by a few years, but really it was an uncle to us. And, um, you know, I remember got a pneumonectomy and, you know, I, I was probably 10 years old and um, eventually died of, of his lung cancer. And that, that, that probably resonated with me. And, you know, as I went through training, of course, I, you know, I was, I was a bit of an athlete and I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon when I went to med school. So of course that you can see how your trajectories change. And, you know, I ended up liking critical care quite a lot. And, and as you, you may know, pulmonary and critical care are, are quite tightly linked. And as I did both pulmonary and critical care, I, I liked uh, the procedural aspects of the pulmonary medicine part, which you know, it's a lot of diagnostic work and a lot of lung cancer work by definition. So it's kind of, it was kind of a long, long haul like that, but I ended up back with, with um, you know, a primary practice looking at uh, after lung, patients with lung cancer and, you know, out of my uh, interest in, in uh, procedural techniques and procedures and uh, may, maybe something from my childhood where, where lung cancer was, uh, what had an impact on my life. On that note, Dr. Tremblay, I think we can conclude today's podcast. Thank you so much for your willingness to share your story and perspective on many of the pressing, pressing issues in the lung cancer world. We appreciate all the work and research you are doing. Well, um, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to our podcast. Please keep an eye out for our upcoming podcasts and events, which will be listed on our website at www.lc.org. We also encourage you to join our monthly newsletter where we share updates on upcoming projects within our organization. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Tremblay. Thank you, Dr. Tremblay.